Over to you, Jan Henrik and Jenny. Hello, everybody. I'm Jenny. Um, I will not present. Jan Henrik will present, but I thought I'm just uh, might say something uh, uh, about me. Uh, I'm a, an architect planner from the beginning, and I do research in in uh, about citizen participation in design planning and renovation, and uh, mostly in in, in uh, suburbs in Sweden, but also in, in poor areas in, in uh, other countries. And I've been quite a long time in Buenos Aires, uh, meeting also our colleagues there. So over to John Henrik. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this presentation. Uh, so I'm also an architect planner, uh, working a bit more with, with uh, multi-stakeholder processes and also having collaborated with uh, Maria Jose and Patrick in different types of waste management and recycling projects uh, in East Africa, for example, and Latin America. So let's get on with the presentation. I'll just briefly present the whole project first. And I would also like to uh, I introduce Michael Oloko, he's not here today, I guess, or maybe, maybe he is somewhere in the, among you participants. Uh, Michael Oloko is a key person in, in Kisumu, Kenya, of course, in the research team. And I would also like to acknowledge all the help we've had from, from other universities uh, in, in Buenos Aires and Cape Town and Havana, and of course, Kisumu. So, Basically, this project starts from, from the, lot, the promotion in, in policy and research about more compact cities, that these cities are, are supposed to help us out with all these challenges that we have, economic, environmental, social challenges. But uh, in the global debate, it's very unclear what actually is supposed to be made more compact. Is it only about pushing more people and buildings into a city, or is it about compacting other things like improving the quality, for example, of urban green structures or social spaces? And when we come to informal settlements, for example, in, in, in Sub-Sahara Africa, uh, who are, and these settlements are usually all, all already very dense, uh, what is it exactly that needs to be made more compact? So that is the starting point for the project uh, to explore a bit what the compact city notion means in informal settlements. Uh, so basically we looked at three different aspects. First, the urban qualities. What are the qualities that are supposed to uh, develop or, or grow from uh, more compactness? And if we know what the qualities are that we want to achieve, uh, what are the different urban development drivers that can help us get there or that maybe stops us from getting there? And if you know something about the qualities and the drivers, what are the strategies that could be developed? And we carried out case studies and in different cities that, that you will see quite soon. Uh, but the focus is really how to learn from different cities and bring that to Kisumu uh, to get the sort of a South-South learning. Uh, so we went to Buenos Aires in Argentina, uh, Cape Town in South Africa and Havana in Cuba, and then of course Kisumu in Kenya. And always trying to understand something in these cities that could be useful in Kisumu. So at the end of the project, we went back to Kisumu and carried out a few workshops discussing what uh, we had learned from the other three cities and uh, trying to make some sense out of that uh, in the sort of a co-production of knowledge uh, workshop. So uh, Buenos Aires uh, in Argentina, which will be presented more later on, it's a huge city and we had four main case areas. Uh, you can see Via 31 and Rodrigo Bueno here in, in the center of the city, La Cava, which is a bit more outside in a very rich neighborhood. And then Los Hornos, which is sort of a rural fringe uh, neighborhood. And Via 31, which is very centrally located, is of course extremely dense. It's a very attractive location. You can see high rises growing up. Uh, and uh, different types of uh, access points to these high rises. And you can see that it's even built under a motorway. Every uh, available space is filled up. Los Hornos, in contrast, is very rural, quite, quite far away uh, from the city, but also attractive because it's quite cheap to live there. But then you have the long distances into the city. And in fact, some people are actually living in uh, uh, 
via 31 for, for the weekdays working and then they come back to Los Hornos uh, during uh, the weekends. Uh, another uh, uh, area via 15, uh, is sort of in between, also quite dense. And then we have La Cava, which is situated in a rich, rich neighborhood in an old uh, brickworks or, or, or quarry. Uh, also very dense, but no high rises here. And we also always try to work with uh, uh, the local communities, kind of engaging them as co-researchers co, co and always trying to report back to these communities when they had uh, developed some kind of results. And I think here you see uh, uh, Rodrigo Bueno uh, uh, located in a sort of a, uh, an ecological reserve. You see the old neighborhood and then the newer housing in, uh, just beside it. And between us, we have one of the most expensive real estate areas in, in Buenos Aires. So it's a very interesting location, but I'm sure we will hear much more about that quite soon. In Cape Town, uh, we uh, went to a neighborhood called uh, Langa, an old township. Uh, this is actually a map of, of, of the different risk areas. And you can see that Langa is in a kind of high risk area. And basically the green areas with the low risk areas are or uh, the, the, the neighborhoods were, were uh, sort of white people or rich people live. Uh, Langa is an old neighborhood from, from uh, apartheid but, uh, where men were allowed to live when working uh, in the city. And it has transformed into a more of a mixed neighborhood. And you can see there's a mix of different types of buildings. Uh, quite a lot of these sheds coming up. And also there are some programs for housing. And again, we try to engage with the local community as co-researchers, uh, exploring and uh, visiting, carrying out interviews, household studies, and again, trying to report back all the time. In Havana, it was a bit different due to the sort of political system. We had to be a bit more detached and not engage so much, but we carried out a number of different sites, observation site studies in the central areas of the city the old neighborhoods, uh, also some informal neighborhoods a bit further out, which was a bit difficult to kind of find because of, uh, again, the political system was a bit resistant to that. And also one of the old Soviet uh, Union housing areas uh, from the 1970s and 60s. And I'm sure you've seen these pictures. And of course, there are huge problems with the quality of housing. Uh, and people try to adapt and sort of intensify their own uh, uh, housing by adding a second floor into uh, uh, these kind of colonial high, high, high ceiling rooms. And it's quite beautiful. Uh, and this is one of the Soviet Union uh, era housing areas where people also try to adapt uh, their housing in different ways, which is kind of quite innovative. And then again, the more informal areas that we visited that are, uh, have sort of a different image to them, of course. And in Kisumu, we worked in two different areas, uh, Nyalenda and, and Obonga. And this is uh, typically what it looks like, sort of quite a rural uh, setting uh, with mud uh, houses. And uh, also quite rural in a nice way. You can see it's quite a lot of greenery and also of course, densifying to these more corrugated steel structures and also some improved housing in different ways. And as they are quite centrally located, you can also see the, the middle class kind of uh, uh, gentrifying the area and pushing people maybe outside a bit more. So what we did there was that we presented the, the towards the end of the project, the, the results that we had from the other cities uh, to the community in these two different uh, neighborhoods. And we engaged them in a workshop format, trying to identify what the different uh, challenges and obstacles were in these areas. Uh, uh, and especially trying them to make them discuss this in a, in a spatial way uh, on maps and indicate on these maps where there were problems, but also very much what could be done with them. Uh, and then present it and discuss it across the groups. 
And the output was something like this, that you could identify some problems, but also quite a lot of, of proposals of what to do with them in the two different neighborhoods. And also identify uh, some uh, sort of strategies for how to do this. And I think that was uh, actually quite interesting to get into that more concrete discussion of actually how can something be done, uh, not just relying on the, on the municipality or the county, but actually do something by themselves. So that was the very short version of, of uh, the project presentation. So now over to Maria Jose. Now you can see the, the screen. Over to you. Okay. In this slide, you can see where Buenos Aires region is located and a map uh, with the localization of informant settlements. Um, in the region of Buenos Aires, metropolitan area of Buenos Aires. Early in the 20th century, around 30s, was emerged the first Villa Miseria, Villa 21, uh, that Gian Henry said, located near to the port. The first dwellers was overseas migrants. Then, in the following decades, the inhabitants were mainly rural urban migrants and from border countries. Uh, since 2000 and to the end to the 2000 then, the informal settlement had the fastest population growth rate. In 2018, uh, the population living in the more than 1,340 informal settlements in a larger metropolitan area were more than 1.2 million around seven to 9% of the total population of the region. Uh, the population densities are often high on average 164 inhabitants per hectare compared to average 38 inhabitants per hectare in the metropolitan region. Next, please. As you can see in this figure, the informal settlements started to appear on a larger scale. This is uh, in the 50s and has grown since and has grown since then, with an exception during the oppression of the civil military dictatorship in the mid 70s and mid 80s due to the violent evictions. Each economic crisis uh, in the early 90s and the early 2000s has resulted in significant additional growth and consolidation of the Villa Miseria. In the uh, actual city of Buenos Aires, more than 200,000 people live in informal areas around more than 7% of population. Uh, in addition, I want to say that uh, during the period 2001-2010, the population of the city increased in a little over 4% and more than a half uh, of it was the growth of the population in Villa Miseria. In the same years, the stock of formal sector houses increased almost 11%. Okay. Uh, this is a little and very short uh, context of Villa Miseria in Buenos Aires region. So thank you uh, and go on. Yeah, I think we continue. Thank you very much, uh, Mariano. And Despite all these structural factors behind processes of urban poverty and inequality embodied in the Villas Miserias, um, urban dwellers also show agency to improve their lives and neighborhoods and resist the processes of urban exclusion. So these acts of resistance are, however, less explicit and less visible than, for example, the Hong Kong protests, the Arab Springs, or the Occupy Movement, or the Fridays for Future, and therefore easier to overlook. 
So in the paper, we draw from the concept of resistance and quiet encroachment developed by the sociologist Asef Bayat, who has uh, studied street resistance and social movements, mostly in the Middle East, and insurgent citizenship by James Holston for the development of favelas in Brazil. And the setting of the paper, as uh, you have already mentioned, uh, Jan Henrik, is the story of one of those villas miserias presented uh, here, the Villa Rodrigo Bueno, and the subsequent attempts of eviction and displacement and the resistance to the upgrading programs. And uh, Patrick is going to tell us now uh, a, a summary of the exciting story of the Villa Rodrigo Bueno. Over to you, Patrick. Thank you. Uh, quite happy to see so many names and faces. We wish to see you in in person any day now. Uh, yeah, first some of the data collection or data production, whatever you want to call it. We, uh, it's, it's been, this study has been taking, out, taking place from 2016, you could say, with Mariano and Cecilia with uh, pre-understanding and, and also started to uh, collect uh, documents and data regarding uh, Buenos Aires, uh, sorry, Rodrigo Bueno. And then the rest of us has been there in three different states, uh, field studies, 2017 and 2018, and different, different constellations. Uh, during these uh, stays, we have been walking around in Rodrigo Bueno, talking informally with people, watching the uh, younger ones playing football in the pitch, uh, talking to neighbors, talking to uh, hairdressers and shop owners, and so to speak, about 40 hours of observations. We also been having the resident association members uh, interviewed, uh, sometimes several times. Uh, we've also been interviewing, as uh, Jenny and Jan Hendrik explained, in other vias to get an understanding of the upgrading programs of uh, Buenos Aires and also uh, about uh, urban planners and city officers. Uh, basically, we wanted to understand where the political activities took, took place and understand the, the embedded context. Uh, we've also been to uh, resident meetings um, and so forth. Next slide, please. Uh, what you can see here is what we all have seen, but the red mark on the left Google map is Rodrigo Bueno. And you can see there how, how it is located just between um, a natural reserve and downtown upscale uh, high-end luxury parts of Buenos Aires. Uh, on the lower part to the right, it's actually not a uh, something that exists. It's a rendition of a uh, luxury development project, Solares de Santa Maria, promoted by International, but it shows the proximity that would have with Rodrigo Bueno, as you can see in the addition to the lower to the lower part, you can see the the uh, informal settlements going there, and they, sh they would share a canal with that development project, and of course it shows and illustrates the uh, well the attractivity of the of the place. Uh, Maria Jose will come back to this later. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, when we started this study in 2016, Rodrigo Bueno was organized in four blocks. Block four further to the east or to the right, and, and uh, the pitch, a football pitch in the middle, and to the left, the road. Around 50% of the inhabitants from Peru, 30% from Paraguay, 10 from Bolivia, and only 10% from Argentina. Uh, 4,000 residents, 1,000 families, more or less, 563 houses exactly. Uh, along the years, uh, ab abandoned by the city government as they have been, the f the uh, uh, they have collectively organized access to electricity, other services. Not really sufficient though, uh, as uh, informal infrastructure often is. Water supply was difficult uh, to access, especially in the block four, furthest away from the road. Pumps were installed later on, not really working all the time. Waste management with, with in, in the containers collected daily and so forth. Uh, however though, the football pitch, uh, which Marco will also come back to, uh, at the center is, is it quite emblematic for the for the neighborhood and it's it's sponsored by Fiat, uh, as we del develop later, which is quite interesting. Uh, it was about 20 shops in 2018 from uh, hairdressers, butcheries, grocery shops, uh, telephone services, pizzerias, and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, in the lower uh, in the lower middle picture, you can see, I hope. Uh, a picture of the piping in uh, block four. It's wet, it's already dug up because there's been a problem there probably. Uh, Rodrigo Bueno's settlement uh, is from the 80s where a few houses were built informally by urban poor working in the informal economy of Buenos Aires. They started to reclaim a then wetland 
at the time abandoned and, dis dis uh, and disused, and it's been over time expanded and uh, become denser as, as a result of what uh, Mariano and um, Cecilia explained with the, with the recessions and crisis, and more people have been drawn or pushed to the informal settlements. In the mid-90s, uh, there was a high-end residential project initiated in the area, Puerto Madero, uh, which, of course, by, by itself attracted a large number of uh, construction workers who, in their turn, could find affordable living in the Rio Bueno, quite close to the construction sites where they worked. Uh, uh, and as it were then, uh, Rodrigo Bueno ended up located at the heart of the most expensive urban neighborhood in Argentina, who many of the dwellers themselves constructed, as they also constructed their own houses. Uh, to the lower right, you can see the pictures, the same picture John Hendrick showed earlier. You see the construction materials on the rooftop, and then in the end, you see the skyscrapers of Puerto Madero. Uh, yeah, so uh, due to this privileged location of the villa, uh, the of course there was quite many economic interests wanting to take take the well to overtake the area, uh, house housing investment political interests. 2005 there was an eviction attempt um, orchestrated by the city, where they tried to uh, evict the settlements. Uh, many houses, and you can see from the down left you see the picture from uh, from that that moment. Quite many families then sold their houses to, to get a subsidy. Others filed a, a collective legal complaint. And then uh, a judge ruled that Rodrigo Gobierno should not be evicted, it should be urbanized. There's a bit of a battle between judges and the city going on here and politics. Uh, we can see that ruling taking place on the top right picture. Uh, that ruling was backed by a coalition of researchers and human rights associations and forced the, uh, the city to present a plan for the social and urban integration of the neighborhood and to provide basic services. However, the city appealed and they really only slowly uh, improved the, uh, the services. So in 2014, this was uh, followed by a new court ruling stating that the urbanization so close to an ecological reserve is not viable. So, halter plans, no more urbanization again. Next slide, please. And then in 2015, uh, three, mainly three um, uh, media events uh, raised the discussion of Rodrigo Bueno again. First of all, um, a tragic death of a 13-year-old who fell into a pit and died uh, was covered and discussed in media and started a wider discussion about the conditions in the villa. Uh, secondly, uh, one of the community leaders who sent the, uh, felt the, the feeling, the threat of the evictions, sent a letter to the Pope who is from Buenos Aires, mind you, uh, via an acquaintances of one of the Pope's uh, deputies. And in the letter, uh, the leader explained the pressures of eviction, as well as the violation of human rights and the lack of services in the neighborhood. And the Pope, uh, in an interview, mentioned the Bueno and the fragile situation there and the bad conditions, and that he felt scandalized by the riches of Puerto Madero on one side, and then the neighbor with the misery in the uh, Rodrigo Bueno neighborhood. And similarly, the story also traveled far from another when another uh, community leader participated in the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights in Washington and gave witness to the uh, struggle slum dwellers all around the world uh, do to keep their houses and, and improve the critical uh, services. 2016 there was a new party uh, ruling and a program for upgrading the villas. And then there was a plan for urbanization and upgrading of Rodrigo Bueno, which in 2019, in June, uh, resulted that 600 of the 1,000 families could live in, uh, move into uh, the new apartment blocks. You can see them on the up right picture, and you can also see the construction of them uh, down to the right. So that was 600 moving into apartment blocks. Uh, the other uh, part of the uh, settlement is now being renovated, some houses are taken down to get, make proper streets and proper services. During the uh, implementation of this project, there's been a lot of tense discussions going on between residents and the project runners, whether to how to how to solve with market, what is with the prices, how should we uh, be able to pay, and 20% of the staff of the construction site had to be from Rodrigo Bueno as well as the result from these negotiations. And of course, uh, it's now there and is now being also the last part being constructed. We don't really know, though, uh, how the future will be, but there are some anxiety and uh, the future. Well, let's see. Next slide, please. 
I will just finish this with um, the, the Facebook page of Barrio Rodrigo Bueno, which is called, not Villa. Now they call themselves a Barrio because they are a Barrio. And here you see the uh, uh, the new apartment blocks to the left and then to the right, uh, the Villa, the, old, the historical site, as they call it, now under construction. This is from August 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And then if we move to the discussion in these last minutes, I will present how the Rodrigo Bueno residents' struggle and strategies of resistance were organized. First, the resistance uh, through space and scale by occupying, by densifying, by disconnecting and reconnecting, and then the development of insurgent knowledge and citizenship. So we start with resistance through space and scale. If we come back um, to the beginning in the years 2000, uh, once the newly created space of the informal settlement had been secured, it was necessary to resist the successive attempts of displacement and eviction. And uh, one of the oldest residents explained in this quotation, you can read here, how uh, after one of these attempts of eviction, the residents' uh, counter reaction was to expand and further occupy the territory inviting others to move in and in this way densifying the settlement in a cat and mouse game with the police and the local authorities. So the physical isolation of the informal settlement and the materiality of the territory, including the available water and resources as fishing in the river that you can see in the left the picture, became an agent of resistance, enabling the villa to grow, densify and defend itself from police attacks. So the isolation also resulted in the development of autonomy, entrepreneurship, and the flourishment of shops, bakeries, batteries that you can see in the upper bill, um, picture that Patrick has been explaining before. And this condition of remoteness or disconnection with the formal city and the formal economy facilitated entrepreneurship and self-urbanism practices that grew under the radar of, uh, of the authorities. Local authorities, however, also set up counter strategies of disconnection when they found it convenient by switching the community off formal services and infrastructures. For example, when during the eviction attempt in 2004 5, existing water and electricity connections were cut off, or later on, when tracks were forbidden to stop by the main road, the Costanera, to discourage drivers from shopping in the villas as they used to, as, for example, Diego is complaining in that, uh, in that interview. So isolation and disconnection have therefore positive and negative uh, effects, intended and unintended consequences, and some of them contributing to resist the situation of urban exclusion of the Rodrigo Bueno community. Yet, despite its isolation, Rodrigo Bueno was constructed, as uh, you were mentioning, Patrick, close to Puerto Madero, a very central urban development that turned out to be the most expensive land in the country. So on one hand, the proximity to this space of economic and political power threatened its existence, and later on with the construction of this new high-end urban development, Solaris de Santa Maria. But on the other hand, it facilitated new resistance strategies by connecting this local community with supporting networks and circuits of solidarity operating at national and global levels, such as religion, religious networks, like the, the story of the connection with the Pope, the, uh, the Commission of Human Rights, uh, presented by, by Diego, for example, and, and so on. So what we argue is that the Rodrigo Bueno, by being connected to several local and global networks, becomes a multiscolar space of resistance. Rodrigo Bueno, and more specifically, particular sites within the Villa, such as the Resident Association headquarters, where the residents are meeting in, in one of the pictures, the football course, or even the walking tours given by some community leaders, provide a safe access to an otherwise isolated and inaccessible environment. So these physical spaces and practices have facilitated what we call extraordinary connections with unexpected actors that in other situations would not have visited these settings. And these spaces constitute what has been called in the literature as relational sites and situations. Resistance spaces such as the Rodrigo Bueno are therefore both disconnected due to this condition of being remote and isolated, facilitating flourishing economic activities, self-construction resistance, and connecting with external supporting networks and actors through these relational sites. And these strategies of connection and disconnection, both of them remain vital for their resistance. It will move now to the second uh, uh, strategy of resistance through insurgent knowledge. Uh, 
the construction of houses and the struggle to defend their rights to housing have resulted first on the development of sophisticated knowledge on governance and its hidden mechanisms and the development of a broad repertoire of strategies of contention, negotiation, quiet encroachment uh, that we will not develop here because of time, but you can read in the paper. And second, in the development of local knowledge regarding, for example, construction skills and law. And I will say just a few words about them to, to illustrate them. Um, Rodrigo Bueno has become a self-learning laboratory as the place was constructed by workers from the Puerto Madero development project. And during that process, these construction workers employed or helped other residents um, to build up their own houses who learned the skills that might develop into a profession, as you can also read in this interview. These skills are used by the residents to negotiate, in the words of one of the interview, from you to you, with architects and lawyers in the new upgrading program. In this way, redefining the boundaries between residents and professionals and reducing the power asymmetry that characterizes participatory processes full with incomprehensible technical jargon. As a resident said to us with irony during a, a meeting with municipal officers where, that we were observing, he said, we are the villeros, they are the technicians. He was stressing with his body language these last two words. So this transformation is not only about development of knowledge uh, that enables them to negotiate on more equal terms with the government, but also an empowerment of this uh, stigmatized community. And you can read in this quotation from a community member how they learn, for example, law, through practice, I really like what Blanca says here, like they think that because they are lawyers, one doesn't know how to defend oneself and doesn't know the law. And honestly, that is not the case. At this point, we learned so much about the law. We have fought so much that no one will come to tell us what is legal and what is not. I am reading law every day. I do not need to study law. We read it so many times that I memorized everything. And the knowledge regards to their, legal, to their legal rights, but also, of course, housing and urban planning, providing the residents with resources to harshly negotiate the terms of the upgrading program happening in the last years, as, for example, Luis explains in this quotation. So in Rodrigo Bueno, residents have turned into builders, urban planners, policy lobbies, and lawyers. And they are examples of Holston's insurgent citizens performing what Apade Duray has coined as the politics of shit, Bayat as ordinary people changing the world and Scott as everyday practices of infrapolitics. So expertise shifts from city officers to the residents of informal settlements. And we argue that in this way, social change moves from the central squares to the city's peripheries. And just to finish this presentation, these findings provide new insights uh, we claim for <clears throat> regarding the role of endurance, local and knowledge, space and scale in resistance studies. First, the study of the Rodrigo Bueno shows the significance of endurance and time in resistance, as knowledge development comes as a result of a life of resisting and learning. There is a community memory storing these learnings, as Manuel Castells has argued before, what could be connected to what Federico Rossi calls as a stock of legacies. Second, densification and urban compactness, I mean, and at the end of the day, this period is about the compactness, are not only physical, social, and economic qualities of uh, many informal settlements, but also a matter of quiet encroachment strategies to resist pressures from the formal city and its institutions. Third, uh, building up on Holston's work, we show how remoteness and isolation can facilitate the spaces for experimentation, knowledge development, and innovation, and through this resistance. So Rodrigo Bueno, these entrepreneurial activities have bloomed and a growing insurgent knowledge regarding governance, city planning and housing has contributed to these resistance strategies. And then finally, we conclude how resistance spaces are not only disconnected due to their remoteness, but also become reconnected as relational sites. And that was all from us so far. <laughs>